Hey, welcome back to Midas Letter Live. My guest in this segment is Jason Zandberg. He is the Special Situations Analyst at PI Financial Corp, covering small cap growth companies. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Jason, you recently uh, initiated, a, or not initiated, but rather reiterated a buy rating for Aurora Cannabis Corp for $13 a share. Recently, it's touched a, a low of $560. And I'm curious to hear if you still stand by that sort of vision for the future price and what are the factors that contribute to your sort of support of it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, we initiated coverage on Aurora just over a year ago. Um, a lot has happened since then. They've made uh, a number of, of large uh, acquisitions, uh, MedRelief being the most recent. Um, you know, we, we, we love the, you know, what their critical mass of production is now. They've been very aggressive in growing their sales. Some of the weakness in the recent weakness, I believe, is due to the uh, med relief shares that were not locked up. Mm -hmm. um, and you have, you know, insiders in, in med relief that are, you know, had been looking to monetize their, uh, their position. So, you know, we did expect some weaknesses, weakness, and um, I think it's a great time to be, uh, to be buying Aurora in this dip. Sure. Kind of, kind of makes it a buying opportunity. Absolutely. Um, do you think that there's a uh, sort of perception on the part of the retail side of the market that they don't really understand the full scope of all that Aurora has become? Because even I, who look at the company on a daily basis, re looked at the press release that they put out yesterday that gave a sort of summary of, of the global sort of state of the union. And I was sort of taken aback by how how I hadn't really considered it in the context of a very, very international footprint. Yeah. And I get the sense that retail shareholders kind of missed that totality of it as well. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of misconceptions about Aurora. Um, you know, I don't know where it stems from, but there t tends to be, you know, a lot of rumors about, um, you know, just in terms of their Aurora Sky facility. And I do, do find that the market doesn't understand uh, the company. Um, but yes, they have a, a great international footprint. They've been one of the more aggressive um, companies that have established production in Denmark, have, have focused on Australia for a long time now, and uh, are, are really you know, looking to be not only a, a big player in the Canadian rec market, but also abroad in Europe and globally. Mm -hmm. Now they also um, have sort of made a move towards the US, though not in the form of Aurora, but mm -hmm. in the form of Australis who is at this point a, uh, an investee company, mm -hmm. and Australis is apparently going to be focused on the United States. What do you know about Australis and that relationship? Yeah, I don't know a lot about uh, Australis. I, I know that they've uh, spun this out. Um, I know that Aurora has spent a lot of time in the U.S. just understanding those mature markets, so they do have a, a good knowledge base there, and I would expect that uh, Australis will you know, we'll capitalize off of that uh, good experience. Sure, access to capital is what it's all about, eh? Absolutely. And no doubt Aurora has lots of that. You uh, have also started coverage of other companies operating in the U.S. and you've become somewhat bullish on the U.S., I guess, as a result of a great deal of research. Yeah, no, absolutely. We had, uh, we had purposely stayed away from the U.S. market for, uh, for some time. This is our um, initiation in, in the U.S. market we released um, coverage or initiated coverage on uh, Canna Royalty and Ianthus uh, just yesterday and also put out a full report in terms of what we see in the U.S. market. Mm -hmm. You know what what I like about the U.S. market is it's a very it's a very developed and mature market even though you know we um, you know it's only kind of state by state at this point but you know we looked at California they've got you know great brands that are developing a great retail landscape it's got a lot more growth to happen but the great thing from an investing point of view is the multiples are less than half of the Canadian peers and we like their upside better. We think that there's, there's more growth there. So we actually believe that over time we will see a premium valuation given to uh, the U.S. cannabis companies and, um, and that that'll means big upside for investors. Sure. Do you think that the, uh, I mean, that was quite the news item that Sam's Nimer, an investor on the West Coast, had uh, been banned for life after admitting to being an investor in U.S. companies listed on the Canadian exchange. Do you think that that is something at this point that Canadians need to be sort of cognizant of and might constitute somewhat of a risk? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, you know, I'm not entirely sure why this policy has been um, sort of 
ratcheted up a bit on, on, the, on the, the border. But yeah, it's definitely um, a risk and it's something that, especially after we have recreational sales in Canada, Canadians crossing the border, this is going to be sort of a new phenomenon that, that, that uh, uh, Canadians will have to get used to. And, um, you know, I don't know, I think at some point the U.S. will change their, um, their scheduling of cannabis at the federal level and this situation will go away. But in the meantime, yeah, it's, it's definitely a concern. Mm -hmm. Isn't there an obligation at this point for the removal of cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act of the United States based on the fact that the FDA has issued a patent for a mm -hmm. drug that is based on cannabis, thereby negating the statement required to be on that list that there is no medical value. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sort of implies to me at least that the federal government is now in a state of, of conflict yeah. that has to be resolved at some point. I mean, absolutely. There's there's a, a numerous inconsistencies in, in the federal uh, stance on, on cannabis. Um, you know, we, in our report, we looked at, uh, you know, polling. We looked at a number of states that have used the legislative process to, to uh, bring in cannabis because it's no, no longer a, a political hot potato. I do expect that, um, you know, over time, I'm not sure exactly when. We're, we're forecasting 2020 to be the year when they reschedule. Mm -hmm. It's just a best guess. It's the next um, presidential election. Sure. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely a lot of inconsistencies, and this will have to be sorted out right. eventually. Do you think that it's going to take that federal deprohibition moment to catalyze the, or rather unleash the growth in U.S. companies listed on Canadian exchanges? Well, no, I, I think that the fact that there is this federal um, uh, scheduling issue in the states is why these U.S. companies are coming to the CSC and listing. I, in fact, the descheduling will be, I, I believe, great for investors but you know we'll start to see U.S. companies listing on U.S. exchanges. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I, I do I do think there'll be more capital available for, to these companies. I do think the valuations will will go up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it definitely will have a different investor landscape from a Canadian standpoint. Sure, the uh, financing of U.S. cannabis companies has pretty much been the exclusive opportunity of Canadian investors because of the federal prohibition. And do you think, I mean, I look at it and I say, think, okay, now's a great time to get into the U.S. stocks on Canadian exchanges because the valuations are low. Mm -hmm. And then when prohibition kicks in and call it 2020, mm -hmm. it's going to be U.S. money that takes those valuations higher and delivers a, a very positive experience for uh, Canadians who stay in it. Absolutely. We look at the U.S. market similar to investing in the Canadian medical marijuana stocks before Trudeau was elected. Mm -hmm. So when Trudeau was elected, you know, I looked at the chart for canopy growth and it appreciated 73% two weeks after uh, Trudeau was elected. And if you look at the long-term um, picture in terms of the, 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 um, the canopy growth stock chart, it's a little blip, meaning that that 73% has been, you know, multiplied many times over. Mm -hmm. We see the same thing happening if you get a, you know, whether it be a, a, a president, a new president that's elected in 2020 that's got a more favorable approach to cannabis or even if Trump is reelected but changes his stance on, uh, on cannabis, we expect that same increase in valuations hmm. to, uh, to happen immediately following that. Do you think that there will be a side effect whereby Canadian listed companies that are obviously much hot, more highly valued are going to experience a sort of stampede away from their stocks into these U.S. opportunities? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I don't think that, that there'll be a complete migration, but you know, even when, when MedMen went uh, public on the CSE, you know, the, the CEO was very clear that this was a sort of a, an interim step before, you know, getting an eventual U.S. listing when, when that time was right, mm -hmm. uh, when the federal regulations were changed. So, yeah, I would expect to see some migration down south, but, um, you know, the, the Canadian market has been very good for, um, uh, for raising capital for cannabis markets, and it's, it's become a bit of a niche market in Canada similar to the mining market where a lot, of, uh, a lot of international money is raised in Canada. So I do expect that to continue, but it may be less so um, if when the federal, U.S. federal regulations change. Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, Ianthus and Canada Royalty. Mm -hmm. What is it about those companies that attracts you? Well, we, uh, we love uh, Canada Royalty um, given their focus on the California market. So they had been for a number of years um, investing in minority interests in, in a lot of U.S. cannabis companies. Uh, they switched over earlier this year to 
by you know 100% and actually operate uh, companies in California. We love California. It's the largest cannabis market in the world. It went you know uh, statewide recreational sales began uh, earlier in January this year. We just think that's a huge market. It's bigger than Canada in terms of population. So you know, Canada Royalty presents one of the best plays in California. Mm -hmm. um, Ianthus, on the other hand, is more East Coast focused. Um, so the one thing about um, Ianthus is that they're well situated in states like New York and Florida, where it's still a medical only only state. But we've found that anyone that that gets roots when it's medical, when it converts into a recreational market, that that's a head start for a lot of these medical companies that have dispensaries in great locations. And so we would expect Ianthus to benefit when we see some more change um, from the state level of recreational laws in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's great, Jason. I really appreciate the input and uh, it was great to finally have you on the show. We hope yeah. to do it again soon. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely, thanks for having me on. Thank you.